Hello, I'm JW. This time I'm going to have a look at a typical sort of domestic installation and really about what parts of the equipment actually belong to who in terms of the incoming supply, the metering equipment and anything that's connected to that. Now uh, I have done a video on this before which covered a real installation but well, that was just a quick overview but in this case we're going to be using this demonstration board here. Now of course this is not connected to any power so therefore it's perfectly safe to uh, poke around with this and see what's contained inside. So let's have a closer look at this and see what we've got. Now what we have here is a fairly typical arrangement you might find in an older property, probably from the sort of 1970s or possibly early 80s, and one that hasn't been updated for quite some time. And uh, regardless of how old this is, the fact remains that there are a lot of properties out there with pretty much this exact same setup still in them, probably sort of 30 or 40 years old. So this is actually a relatively common arrangement, but of course in some cases it may be slightly more up-to-date stuff. Now what we've got here is obviously not connected to any power, so it's perfectly safe. And what we've got at the bottom here is the incoming supply cable. And this comes in from the road or the street. It could be overhead or buried underground or whatever. It comes in here and it comes into this uh, device we've got here. Now this has various names, one of which is the cutout, also known as a head and also known as the main fuse. So various names for that. And essentially all we've got in here is the cable coming in fuse in this side which we'll have a look at in a minute and then the neutral side here just has a link that goes straight through. Now the top here we've got the two wires here, the line and neutral. Again these are in the old colours, black and red. Modern ones would be blue and brown. And these come in and go straight into the electricity meter we've got here. Again this is an older mechanical type. So the two wires go in here, this is actually my main on this side. And then two wires coming out of there which is the load side. And again, they're the same black and red we had before. And these go across here into our fuse box over there. Now this particular one is the equivalent of a TNS supply where the earth connection is actually provided on the outer covering of the incoming cable. Now we can see here that someone has used an inappropriate uh, VS951 pipe clamp to attach to that. And while these are not supposed to be used for this, again, it's incredibly common to find these, certainly on smaller domestic properties. And uh, so this is pretty typical of what we find. Main earth wire here, this is just bare copper, and it just goes over to this uh, earthing block here. This will be your main earth terminal. And then we've got another piece of the bare wire, in this case, just goes out again to our fuse box over there. Now, if there was any, this is where the main bonding would go to the uh, sort of water supply or the gas supply or whatever else, so hence a couple of terminals in there. Got a separate block here, but on some of these, uh, this earth wire would just go straight into the fuse box, and then you just connect, uh, obviously, to whatever inside there. And it's also common on certainly older properties to find that the main bonding is completely missing or that it's uh, too small or whatever to comply with regulations of today. Now this is done up here as effectively a TNS supply, so you've got your two wires within the incoming cable, go through to the top, and then the earth is on the outer covering. Typically that would be a lead-covered cable, and then this just uh, clamps onto the outer covering there for the earth connection. If this was a TNCS, more common on uh, more recent properties, then uh, the cable would be coming in. You wouldn't have a connection on the outer of the cable. It just has two uh, conductors inside, one of which is the line there, and the other one is a combined neutral and earth. So what would happen here is you've got a neutral connection coming out like that. You'd also have a separate connection on the side here quite often, which would then be for the earth, and they're actually both connected together inside here. Now just a word of warning, if you see that connection on the side, it doesn't always mean that it's TNCS because there are cutouts designed which have three wires coming in the bottom and then although you've got the earth terminal here, it is actually a separate connection to a separate conductor in the cable. So don't assume that it's fairly common if it's on the side for that to be a TNCS. Now the other type of installation is a TT. This is where you'd have your own earth electrode installed outside. And for those ones, all you get is the cable coming in with the two conductors line in neutral. And there is no earth connection here whatsoever, so it doesn't have any of this, no connection on the side. This uh, main earth here would then go outside to the earth electrode in the garden or wherever. Now let's have a look at who owns what and uh, what you're actually allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. So uh, starting over this side, the main incoming cable and the cutout or head here this belongs to the DNO, or the Distribution Network Operator. Now this is a company which basically deals with the infrastructure, so it deals with the cabling and actually gets electricity to your house. And it also deals with this uh, particular item here. 
Now you can't choose who the DNO is, it depends entirely on where you happen to be located, and say in the uh, southern area here, that would be Scottish and Southern Power Distribution, and if you live in other areas of the country then it will be somebody else. Now there's a handy map here which just gives you an overview of the various companies involved. However, don't rely on this map because of course it could be out of date. Just go to the website there and you can find out who it is for your particular area. Now the DNO is the company you would call if something has gone wrong with this, so say for example the main fuse had blown, or there was some general power cut, or we found this thing was on fire, or melting, or there was hot uh, tar dripping out the bottom, or anything to do with basically this and the actual cabling that comes into your property. So if you wanted to have this moved or relocated, again the DNO is the company you would need to contact for that. Now the second part of this is the actual electricity meter, and also these two wires which connect the electricity meter to the cutout here. And this is the responsibility of whoever you buy your electricity from. Now this can be a whole load of different companies, and if the one you're with happens to be too expensive, well you can just simply change to another one which is cheaper. So all of this from here to here, and including the meter itself, is the responsibility of whoever you're paying your electricity bill to. And of course that depends on who you've selected. And that is the company you would contact if there was any problem, say, with the amount you're being charged, or if, say, the meter went wrong and didn't actually have any reading on it, or it just jammed or something. Or, for example, this meter actually accidentally fell off the wall and was tilting at a weird angle or something. So that's the company you're buying it from. And I say, if you're uh, buying it from the default supplier, then you're almost certainly paying way too much. Probably going to to look around and choose a different supplier, because they're more than likely going to be considerably cheaper. Important to note that the company you buy electricity from can't help you with things like the main fuse is blown, or there's a power cut, or this has gone wrong or been damaged, because it's an entirely separate company. A very long time ago it was all the same company, but uh, since privatisation then it's all going to be completely separated, so one company and another. Now the third part of the installation is the wires from here going into the fuse box, fuse box itself, and then any circuits connected to that. And these are the responsibility of the building owner. So if it's your property, all of this is your responsibility. And if something's gone wrong with it, then that's you should get an electrician to come along and probably replace this with something rather more up-to-date, update the uh, earthing size, and so on. And if you're living in a rented property, then again, this is going to be the responsibility of the landlord, the person who owns the property. So again, if something goes wrong with this, or flames come out of it, it doesn't work anymore, you'll need to contact the landlord to get that fixed. And of course, they should send a competent person along to deal with that. And a final point to note here is you'll see that the actual head or the cutout here and the electricity meter are both mounted on this separate board at the back here. This is really a leftover from the days when it was all done by the same company so that uh, this board is ideally for the metering equipment and the incoming supply and the cutout only. You do not want to be attaching your consumer unit or the fuse box to that board. The same applies to the external metering cabinets, which are more common on more up-to-date properties. Again, that's just for the uh, incoming cutout and the metering equipment, and a lot of them have actually a label on there stating that. So though it's two separate ones, it's uh, designed for those two items only. And we'll see the fuse box here is actually mounted on the wall rather than that uh, separate piece of board. Now if this backboard becomes damaged, or goes rotten, or falls to pieces or whatever, or if any of this equipment on here becomes loose and starts to fall away, then you would need to contact the DNO in that case to actually come along and fix that situation, and they will obviously then tighten up the backboard, put a new one in, or do whatever they need to do. And it's certainly not something you should attempt to replace yourself, and in fact you can't actually do it yourself properly because the meter of course is generally sealed, as is the cutout. Screws to the meter are not accessible without actually undoing it and breaking the seals and doing whatever. So that's uh, who you would call in the case of that being damaged. Now here's another scenario which uh, someone did actually ask on Twitter the other day, and they did get the various responses, and most of the responses were actually correct. And the deal here is that what happens if this cable coming into your house and the cutter or head here is in the wrong place, or you need to move it for some reason, or in the case of the one on Twitter there, it was actually the case that somebody wanted to have this uh, moved so they could waterproof the wall behind it, because it happened to be in a cellar or a basement. And the answer with this is that you most certainly do not attempt to move any of this equipment yourself. First of all, because this doesn't actually belong to you, it's responsibility, say, of the DNO, and that would be the responsibility of the metering company or the electricity supplier. Now, the problem with these cables is that the older ones are a lead and paper type, so basically it's the two conductors inside. 
they have a paper wrap around those conductors for insulation and then there's a lead covering over the outside which is used as the earth as similar to what we've got here and then over the top there's usually a steel banding and then some uh, sort of hessian and possibly some tar and various other things as well now the problem with those is don't be ever tempted to try and move these or just uh, pry them away from the wall so you can paint behind it whatever because a lot of these cables are decades old and in some cases many decades old and if you were attempting to move this there's a fairly good chance of the cable becoming damaged internally and shorting out either between line and neutral or between line and the outer casing, which is the earth. And if this happens, bear in mind what's on the end of this is probably going to be a 400 amp fuse in some cases, maybe an 800 amp fuse in other cases, or maybe no fuse at all if it's been replaced with solid links because the demand in the area has increased. So if you short out here, the fault current could be in the order of, say, many hundreds of amps, but it's probably not going to blow the fuse, simply the fact that the impedance of this simply isn't low enough to reliably operate, say, a 400 or 800 amp fuse. So what will happen is it will just burn from wherever the fault is and continue burning and destroying the cable until either the fuse at the other end does eventually fail or someone goes and actually cuts off the supply to half of the street. And of course by then you've caused a massive amount of fire and damage here. All of this will be completely obliterated. And bearing in mind, even if you had, say, 500 amps going here in the end of this, that's going to result in a heating effect of many tens of kilowatts. So basically this whole area will be completely destroyed and eliminated. Anyone in the vicinity is going to be severely injured. And basically half your house is going to be on fire. So any cables like this are never moved, and you certainly don't go in and sort of just pry it from the wall or whatever. That is absolutely unsafe and ridiculous. And it's the same reason why you don't start undoing the screws here and trying to move the board and all the rest, because the danger of failure in that cable is significant. Now, of course, what you should be doing in the case of those is to call the DNO, whoever they might be, and then request a service alteration, and then they can relocate this equipment to somewhere else in the property, or more likely outside into a metering cabinet. And bearing in mind that even when they come along to do it, they don't start undoing this and moving this cable because, again, that's too dangerous. What will happen is they will go out into the street or in your driveway, dig a big hole, or you can dig it yourself if you want to save a bit of money, and then they will simply cut the old supply cable and join on a brand new piece which they've already installed to the new location. So even the DNO don't actually start taking these apart and moving them because it's simply too dangerous. The risk of an explosion and fire is simply far too great. So that would be simply a new one of these in a new cabinet outside, new cable coming out into the driveway or wherever at the front of your property. And then say they'll just simply cut the existing supply cable, join in the new one, and then uh, that will be just buried under the ground as a permanent joint. And that jointing is normally done live. But again, that's actually still much safer than trying to move and bend around manky old cables that have been there for 50, 60 years or more. Another problem with these older types particularly is at the bottom part here, it's quite often filled with tar, or pitch, which is a black substance which is solid when cold. And when it gets hot it uh, turns into a nasty, viscous liquid. And you'll sometimes see at the bottom here that the pitch is actually dripping out. Now that uh, can be a problem if it's still hot and dripping. Quite often the case it's just dripped over a long period of time when it got slightly warm or whatever. So even if you wanted to undo this and dismantle it, well again you can't because it's, it's filled up with that uh, black pitch or tar-like substance. Now, it's certainly the case that having all this equipment relocated elsewhere is certainly going to cost a certain amount of money, but ultimately that is the only choice. There's no other way of moving it, so if it's not in the place you want, then of course you're just going to have to pay up, have this uh, relocated somewhere else. And in terms of the metering equipment, if you wanted that relocating, then in theory you can have the meter moved away from this and put somewhere else, but in reality they're generally kept together. If you have the metering put somewhere else, say in a block of flats or something, then the cut out here with the fuse in will still exist but then you'll probably have another one similar to this next to the meter they would generally have a red link inside which is just a solid link no fuse included and that's just so you can isolate when uh, installing the meter and of course it's not to necessarily then to go to some remote place and uh, isolate it there and then the other thing as well if you want to have your consumer unit moved away from the metering equipment again that's totally possible and an electrician can do that for you However, there is a maximum length of these wires, and it's generally around 3 metres. So if these are going to be more than 3 metres long, what you need to do is to fit a switch fuse on these next to the metre, for example. And then from there you can have a cable as long as you want, going to wherever your consumer unit is located. 
So that's certainly a possible option. Electrician will do that for you. But in terms of any of this stuff and the cable, it comes down to the DNO only. And of course, they will charge you a fair amount of money to do that. Now, because this is just a demonstration model and it's not connected to any power, we can have a look inside here and see what's going on. Now, this one's made by Henley, as most of these tend to be. And this is actually a Series 3 because it's a fairly old example. So it's got these sort of wooden plugs in the bottom. So that would normally be filled with pitch as well. So uh, let's have a look in here. This one has little uh, screws on the front here. Some of the newer ones don't have screws. They just have a removable cartridge. And generally you'd find there was a sealing wire through here to uh, prevent people tampering with it. And again, this is not something you should be removing yourself because, again, it belongs to the DNO. And in theory, they're the only ones that should be removing it. Now, in this side here, we can just uh, pull this out. And what we've got in here is actually a fuse and uh, two contacts inside there. Over on this side, there's no fuse. It's just a straight through connection. This may not be exactly the correct connection here, but uh, good enough for this model anyhow. So neutral just comes in from the supply and then just joins directly onto the neutral outside there. So no fuse in that side. This side, however, does have a fuse. And we've got here at the bottom, this is the incoming terminal. So even with the uh, thing removed here, this is still live. And that's the one where you've got nothing between this and the nearest substation or transformer, possibly an 800 amp fuse or something like that, but uh, definitely not something you want to be poking out at all there. And then the top here is where the line comes out to your installation and the fuse just bridges between those. So in the event of it being overloaded, this fuse will blow and then disconnect the supply. And also removing this will also isolate the supply as well. But remember, the neutral is always connected. It's uh, permanently installed there. Now the bottom part here, there are no connections. It is literally just the two cores, one to here and one to there. And as I say, they're normally filled up with pitch. This has a little uh, lid on the top here where you would uh, seal all these up first, heat it up in a pot, and then it will be tipped in there to seal it in. The newer ones generally don't have that, but uh, they're fairly common on the older examples. Now in terms of the meter, this is generally sealed as well to prevent tampering. Of course this is just a demonstration, so we can have a look in here. This cover comes away. So what we've got here is four terminals for the wires here. Incoming on this side, so the line and the neutral, just two screws for each. And then the neutral and line coming out. Again, just two screws there again. Now this terminal arrangement has been used pretty much forever. And even modern meters have this same terminal arrangement. So it's a line neutral coming in and then neutral and line going out. And they're put in this particular order because generally the two neutrals are usually part of the same solid block. It's just simply there so they can provide a reference for the voltage. So the voltage is basically between the line and neutral. The current measurement is generally done on the line, which obviously goes into the meter and comes out there. So in theory, if you connect the meter up with only one neutral, it would actually work perfectly well. But of course, you need the two there to obviously connect the incoming and outgoing wires. The only variation on this is that some meters have more than one rate. So there'll be things like economy seven and so on. And some of those have an additional fifth connection here, which is switched depending on the time of day and whatever. But uh, the first four are always the same. They just have that fifth one there, which may go to a separate consumer unit or, say, a contactor or some other device for the off-peak supply. And you quite often see these things actually numbered, particularly if you had a new meter installed. So they were numbered one, two, three, and four. And then uh, that just ensures they all go back in the same order. And occasionally you'll see, say, the letters L and N here. And this will have N, N, and L, L to indicate that it's the pair for over there to differentiate it from here. And there's other versions as well, like having a uh, ring of plastic cable tie on these two and having two rings on those two in the appropriate colours. So a number of variations there, but uh, essentially it's always the same ordering there. No particular difference even with the really modern ones. Now these two wires coming out of here, or the tails as they're usually known, these are actually the responsibility of the building owner, so it goes along with the fuse box or consumer unit. So if you have your consumer unit replaced, normally you'd want to have these things replaced as well. But of course, you're not supposed to be opening this because that would show up as tampering on the meter. So in theory, what you're supposed to do is to have the electricity supplier come along and actually put new ones of these in. You can obviously have the electrician or whoever supply those. And then the other thing you can have is that they may, in some cases, provide you with a double pole isolator. 
so that they'll put uh, new wires from here into a separate isolator here and then that's where you would connect in your new tails to your new consumer unit and of course because it's an isolator you can just switch that off and connect in there perfectly safely. Now while we've got this old fuse box here we may as well have a look inside that as well. It'd be fairly rude not to. And so this is probably from the 1970s. This style was actually made for several decades including well up into the 1980s and even the early 90s so very common style. The only real difference is the newer ones had a cream plastic rather than this dark brown but they were very similar in fact almost identical. This one uh, has the switch on the side here so off there and then in the on position there. Fuse is concealed behind this cover here. Inside the lid it's got a little legend where you can write in what they're actually for so in this particular case we have uh, 13 amp sockets, lights, cooker and immersion. Whoever wrote that in a long time ago. Generally on these uh, you want to be turning the power off before touching any of these because if some moron has uh, put the fuse wire in wrongly you may find there's strands of it just at the top or the bottom here. So you do that there and you've got an electric shock from it. And of course there's no RCD or anything on this type of system so no real protection there. Now uh, fuses on this uh, just pull out. I've done several videos on these before so uh, not going to go into any major detail but uh, basically two prongs there with the fuse wire between them and the others pull out in pretty much the same way. These pads here may be asbestos in some cases and not in others and you'll note that the uh, different ratings of fuse have different sized blades and the reason to stop that is you can't then put your 30 amp fuse into the 5 amp slot. You can put the 5 amp one into the 30 amp slot but of course that's not going to achieve much it would just pretty much blow straight away. Another 30 amp one there and then this 15 amp one was for the immersion heater. There were 20 amp ones of these which were yellow. They are fairly rare because uh, on rewilder fuses you can't have equivalent to 25 millimeter squared wiring with a 20 amp fuse. It will need to be four and then there's not really much point because you might as well just go up to the 30 anyway which will show your ring main or ring circuit. Now to take off the cover of these you do have to remove all of the fuses because they actually overlap so hence we've removed it there. And these are just held on with these screws on the corner here. There are four positions for screws as you see there's one at each corner but in pretty much every case you'll find there's only two screws. Quite why that is isn't clear but uh, they all seem to be basically like that. And by screws we just mean normal wood screws, nothing uh, particularly unusual about those. Now note this is in the off position. We'll just take the uh, cover off here. And now we have one of the main disadvantages of these things. You can see the letters on and off at the same time so uh, just be careful of uh, these because with the front removed it's not immediately obvious whether it's on or not. These terminals here are the incoming supply so this one here is still live even with this turned off so don't go uh, brushing against that because that's a fairly dangerous electric shock there. There are supposed to be plastic covers that fit over these. They're quite often missing as they are in this example but even so just remember this is live all the time. The only way to disconnect this is to remove the cutout fuse or have the meter disconnected. So uh, line in here, neutral in here, double pulse switch, line goes across the bottom here. The neutral comes to here and actually goes up there to this block and that's where your neutrals would connect for the four circuits. Earth connections up the side here, so just got this four here, one for each circuit and then a couple of others there for your incoming earth which is this uh, flimsy thing here and another one say for your bonding to the water or gas. Now in terms of getting inside here these uh, covers here or the shields do unscrew. Just take away this uh, red one on the end here. And then we can see behind there this is the uh, main bus bar with the line on it. Piece at the bottom here where the fuse will fit in. So there's the fuse that just presses into there and then it presses into the top there and that's where your outgoing circuit will be connected two screws on each course and then the fuse wire just bridges between the two so in the event of overload or short circuit this will melt through disconnecting the supply and the others are the same just have different size slots on the front shield but any colour one can fit on any of these it doesn't actually matter. One thing to note on these is that uh, this is the live for the outgoing 
circuit number one, and this is the neutral for them, so if you leave any stray strands of wire just hanging out of here, it can quite easily short onto the neutral and therefore blow the fuse there, so not uh, particularly recommended. And you'll also find on these, once the wire's in here, it actually goes across the front of the screws for one of the neutral circuits, so again, not a particularly useful design there. But uh, say these are very common even now, either with this, the wooden back or the plastic ones, as they were fitted literally in their millions over a period of several decades. So let's look there at a typical installation there, and uh, which parts belong to who. Now in terms of the DNO, you can use that map I showed earlier to find out which one it is for your area, but if you just need to call them for any reason, there's a much easier way. Just call 105, and that will connect you to the right place automatically, so you don't have to search up whichever company it is. And bearing in mind, it's the DNO for anything to do with the uh, fuse cutter or incoming supply, or if there's a power cut or whatever. Metering equipment in the middle is the company you're buying the electricity from, and anything else beyond that is your responsibility or the landlord if you happen to be renting the property. So uh, that's pretty much it for this time. Until next time, thanks for watching.